Hello everyone, today we talk about the Sarmatians, right? This large confederation of ancient Eastern Iranian um, equestrian nomadic peoples that had quite an important role during classical, in part also late antiquity, right? This video is born like, in theory, you know, part of the migration era peoples series. But not quite, right? Because they, the, the Sarmatians dominated mainly, right? The, the Pontic steppe from about the third century BC. So we are exactly in the moment which uh, the same Roman expansion um, uh, takes off in the Mediterranean up to the fourth century AD, but with lots of persistences in, in these places that we have had the opportunity to already analyze in that video about the Alani. Or the Alans, I will, I will probably say Alani just um, to define also uh, with the Latin plural other um, other peoples of the Sarmatian uh, confederacy. In fact, that at some point also uh, quarreled pretty much with one another, as we will see uh, today. And we have seen also in other videos, such as the one about the the sword in the Iranogermanic culture, and and others, generally speaking, about late um, Roman cavalry and a bit migration here in general. The um, the the in fact the enormous impact that the Iranian peoples in general, but at this point, at least in terms of political identity, what. Uh, had been up to that point the Sarmatians had in the development especially what we consider a bit the, or at least in the re uh, revival especially speaking from a European perspective of the in fact uh, knight right of the knightly um, mythological uh, centrality as far as the hero transfiguration the, the the connection between man and, and God and so what was concerned. We've seen with the Alani that this military tradition was particularly um, uh, intense. It's basically the same one that gave birth to the uh, legions of uh, of the Arturian cycle. The uh, Alan bodyguards are to be found practically everywhere, from from the Roman to the Chinese, even. To the Mongol empires, late in, as in, in the Middle Ages, you know that we, we think um, that the accessions to be roughly the at least the last, um, say, closest relic to the uh, to the Alani and a bit like of the Sarmatian peoples in general. So we will, over time, digress a bit more powerfully on all of these topics. For today, I just want to keep it short as a, in fact, as a very short introduction, which I r literally mean. Sometimes people say, well, man, you said very short introduction, just do like a two hours long video. Well, I know, because that's technically what it is, right? If you want to know anything about them, you must start from the basics of the topic that if you really want to master, you have to spend mostly many years, right? And also with an adequate background and method, etc., to fully in fact appreciate um, so we will talk a bit about everything here the uh, you know the origins of the Sarmatians the you know their cultural background etc um, these peoples originated in the central parts of the Eurasian steppe right and today we'll not get in, into the prehistory of that because um, we just begin literally with the third but at the oldest, the 4th century BC. In any case, the Sarmatians or originate from this phase of Indo-European dominance of the Eurasian steppes, uh, unequivocally, also all the genetic studies, as, you know, uh, quite meager as they can be as a statistical evidence, because naturally we have a very, a very few finds of the wall of people, uh, as it was, you know, reveal quite strikingly also for the Scythians, um, a brutally homogeneous uh, Indo-European background. And I know that there are lots of people who especially look at the thing from a Turkic perspective and start saying, oh no, this is propaganda, whatever. But th that's actually the thing, right? There is no doubt that there is a mix there. Um, but the range of properly Indo-European 
not just uh, it's not just about satellites. We're talking also about properly domination seems to, to have stretched much more eastwards than we normally think. And um, again, I, I shall make precise videos to, to demonstrate this because at least it, it is common knowledge if you have looked at the most updated uh, genetic studies and everything. But it, it's still, of course, shrouded a bit in mystery for, again, the insufficient amount of um, completion, let's say, as far as this data, as any other data of the same type for, for these eras. But, you know, if you look at the Eurasian steps, we don't technically know what the hell happened to some peoples that we know were there, say, in antiquity, uh, in medieval times, in, in the modern age, because, say, with, I don't know, with the Tsarist conquest, the, the Soviet Union, I mean, literally, th th these peoples vanished, were deported, were massacred, there were lots of other mix, um, a relocation, and so on. So uh, there are peoples we call in a certain way, but that have hardly, the ethnonymically, I mean, but that have hardly much to do uh, with the older peoples that bore that name, except the fact that, of course, that we know it was yes, like a, a huge blender, uh, and uh, you can easily find any trace there. But quantities are another thing. Now, um, the Sarmatians, there is a bit of terminology here, um, first of all, are technically part of the wider Scythian culture, even though the Scythians figure as a, as a different people, the broader Scutai, um, and the also the, the same concept of, of the socket depends also which languages from Greek to Persian you use basically was aimed to define a bit the same uh, population that at least as a pool as a cauldron of a pretty diversified amount of um, of cultures because um, this this is another point the fact that there was a, a very significant for example an, an evident uh, ethnic similarity it doesn't mean that in fact these peoples were all alike we we don't know essentially among them say among the, the various tribes that were around uh, in this time and 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 space that who was who uh what were their uh, origins aside from the yamnaya's uh, background but even before that and even grafted on that how many other backgrounds existed this is another thing that i've seen People having problems um, digesting in the sense that we will talk about it later, especially as far as what did the Sarmatians stereotypically look like and so on. Um, you know, th th there is a striking similarity in these steps um, as far as practically every aspect of material culture and thus of archaeological finds are uh, are concerned, right? Um the, there are no clear tags. We don't know who was who unless you have, in fact, written records. Because without those, we literally wouldn't know anything, and archaeology would be almost useless. And yes, finding kind of more kurgans or more swords doesn't actually tell you what the hell was happening there, politically speaking, cultures were over this enormous amount of time. So not that archaeology actually does much even today, and you know there are vicious mechanisms. Uh, around that in terms of, you know, very menial interests that I'm not going to descend in, that basically emphasize even many, at least not much in this case, but especially actually in the most densely, um, you know, um, populated places, as far as, in fact, it also defines and, uh, you know, the, the, the wealth surplus can leave our archaeological... Um, evidence, um, and th therefore um, it's obvious that these populations were mixed with others at different times. Uh, it's obvious that it, th that's yet another enormous problem, given that these peoples didn't write essentially uh, anything, and they they wouldn't um, they wouldn't let us know essentially how they even thought of themselves, if it makes even sense to think that the Sarmatians existed conceptually, aside from the Hellenic and uh, Roman historiography, because this is just like the Germans, like we don't have an evidence of themselves calling them like that. As a matter of fact, we have 
um, and that's also a delicate thing we'll have to make another video on specifically. They call themselves mostly uh, another thing, first of all, but they had an identity that was universal in kind, not truly national in kind. First and foremost, they looked at individual power, status, um, and of course they didn't give a fuck about each other. Also because they kept, you know, as all these tribal populations continuously slaughtering, enslaving, raping each other all the time, um, besides trying to do it with the more sedentary civilizations that they never managed to really break through in. So it that's the brutal reality of especially an area like the steppes. And the Sarmatians, as we will see, uh, had uh, this this heyday, right? The the migration westwards from more central Asian areas towards the Pontic steppe around the fourth and the third century BC that uh, brought to the ousting of the still closely rela related Scythians. Even there, what's the difference between again a Scythian and a Sarmatian? It's a question that doesn't practically make any sense, right? Because they would have not really seen it besides, at best, the single political entities um, that were moving at different times from this broader pool that may have surely been identified in a way, but it was not so important to them um, after all, right? And the, they, the Sarmatians suffered practically the same fate because they have the moment of greater prosperity around 100 BC, these tribes, not having even completely eliminated, of course, uh, the political identity, for example, of the Scythians in the process, but essentially having a, an area of domination that stretched from the Vistula River uh, to the mouth of the Danube, and Black Sea, and eastward to the Volga, the Caspian Sea, and the Caucasian Mountains in the south. So you can easily understand, we will see that there is also a practically non-existent eastern frontier, right? We know the Sarmatians, again, why? Because fortunately enough, Mediterranean civilizations wrote about them and we, let's say, see them uh, f through, through information that they would have never left us uh, anyway. And uh, aside from that, if you go towards Central Asia, you don't really have the same degree of civilization that is able to, um, uh, say, ethnographically uh, describe these peoples in, in detail, right? And if we know something, it's mostly from, from those areas, right? And from the, uh, you know, the very opposite end, China, but still with much greater difference from the analytical and kind of uh, rationalistic um, tendency of at that point of Hellenistic literature, right? So it's uh, it's um it's a completely different story, and naturally, uh, you know, I've made video about the Kuchan, I made a uh, video about the Tocharians, so we know enough about lots of peoples, but um, as far as the eastern sector of this Iranian people is concerned, we, we know relatively less, with less clarity than we can know in the West, where you can, in theory, just pinpoint certain specific groups, tribes, uh, etc. Um, so in the first century AD, this is another f feature of Sarmatian history, the, of course the, the Sarmatians had come to gravitate around the Roman Empire. Right, and to catalyze those processes that would um, eventually um, uh, produce the uh, coalescence of the same Germanic tribes that they didn't come to, to hegemonize, but they, they surely had uh, an influence on as far as the, the combined raids in the Roman frontier was concerned, uh, which facilitated, in fact, this, this political compaction and kind of military strengthening of the, um, of the same Germanic uh, peoples, right? Uh, that started to become a threat, actually, for the same Sarmatians that would be overrun by uh, the Goths, right, this Eastern Germanic people in the 3rd century AD, uh, I made video about the the gods splitting towards this at least this 
Eastern greater power that uh, were not known as the Ostrogoths at the time, but approximately many specifications would have at least composed a, a good part of the later uh, Ostrogothic people. This process was very important because the gods fundamentally installed themselves um, in the in the same areas that the Sarmatians had been trying to control as far as the more civilized coastal urban uh, sanitary areas were, were concerned like the uh, the germans were semi nomadic at this point in the measure in which they could s- start moving in groups over by the way a, a significant amount of time um but they were fundamentally sedentary peoples, right? The Sarmatians really weren't. Surely there was a degree of sedentarization that we can't see too much just because also the potential of the ancient world was lim- more limited in terms of surplus and so on. So the steps, the Western Eurasia, we've made many videos about this, would call as towards a you know, very slow but still you know, continuous sedentarization that you can appreciate archaeologically. But at this point, the Sarmatians are really um, nomadic in nature. And so, as far as the Reitervölker are concerned, and all the, the mystique even of this um, the aforementioned knights that would reinject even, the, in fact, in, in Central and Eastern Europe and beyond, really, this sense of the, of the original, um, essentially of the, the traditional spirit of the, the primitive hero of, of the eternal struggle, the, the doctrine of, um, in fact, struggle and victory, and so on, well, had, would have a, a major impact in the, entire, in the entire Europe, Mediterranean. The same Roman Empire fundamentally was regalvanized, even much of the Christian military language is fundamentally a product of the prestige that, you know, Essentially, in a proto-feudal system, uh, if Rome had even ever technically not been a feudal power herself, by some standards, uh, was reactivated um, in something you can see in the Romano-Germanic world, you can see in part also in the Slav Byzantine one. So it's a big topic, I'm not going to digress on it, but um, we have seen also in videos about, for example, the, the, the Slavic... Um, migrations, the, the the ethnogenesis of certain politics like the Croats, the Serbs, that there is a strong Iranian um, at least um, suspect, um, you know, behind in fact the conglomeration of, of these populations in the first place, the herds of peoples, right, of, you know, quite warlike, a brutally autocratic step rulers in their own, at least clinic background could easily subjugate some of the peoples that had remained out after the great migrations in some of the most the least populated areas in Europe but that would settle as far as actually very far I mean the Alani eventually mixed with the Vandals but I mean ended up in Spain in in Africa there are some places in Portugal still today to bear memory of that the same Alan dog basically is um, is a is a relic of, of Alan of this great hounds that the 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 Sarmatian aristocrats use in their hunting and in their in their wars well um, you know that in fifth century Gaul there was you know a a, a Sarmatian an an Alan signory revolving around Orléans that eventually was uh, incorporated by the Romano-Germanic reality there so really lots of traces, lots of movements, lots of identities that unfortunately we can track well, even for Central Europe up to significantly late in times and times even the high Middle Ages when most of them had settled and created a different political territorial identity that didn't bear that name anymore. Um, there are, sure, modern uh, genetics can help on the I mean, on, on the on today's populations to, to understand some of these mechanisms, but again, I will not digress on this as well, right? Um, so the the gods, as you know, created um, a Bosphoran uh, dominion, as it had basically always existed, a sort of client state of Rome, and even before that, from essentially a Cito Hellenic background. Um, that launched uh, raids into, in fact, the Black Sea, the Levant, and so on, until the Huns arrived. 
And so this kind of Iranogermanic reality that was, especially in a Germanic perspective, the most glorious in many ways, it was, it was truly, you know, the product of a, of a blend between um, the, the Germans and the Iranians, especially the first seeing this, this land as probably the one of the rising sun, the one from which they could dominate to unprecedented prosperity compared to the northern Europe, was significantly impacted and practically crushed by the Hanic invasions, right? Uh, I know that there are lots of people who want to say that the Hans were, I don't know, uh, Germanic, actually, no, they weren't, right? We don't have a clear idea of what they were, but they were a blend um, dominated likely by a Turkic Mongol element, right? And uh, genetic finds support this with East Asian traces in this context and Politically speaking, we, we know, right, what, what happened exactly. We see that also archaeologically speaking. It was, th these were areas that were severely impacted and by a significant degree also devastated by the Huns, right? Um, it's at that point, in fact, that the Sarmatians start what had remained because the Goths controlled mostly the, the Black Sea area, the Dnieper, the Dnest, um but there were these other Iranians in the east, and these flocked, in fact, uh, together with, with uh, other Germanic populations in, in the west at that point as mostly a minority element, right? Surely an important one, an evaluated one. This is not to say that even among the Huns, the, um, the Sarmatians or the Germans were not important. They actually were, right? But they were evidently, uh, if not, you know, full subjects, but definitely, you know, some subordinates, to, to, to say the least. Um, and that, in fact, uh, exactly under, in, in, during that period, underwent a significant change, also in the type of mentality of the step, in a much more autocratic way, and you can't really see much of a difference between that type of military culture and the one, of, in fact, of, of the step there, which was not so strong uh, in uh, among other, for example, further northern Germans or western Germans as it is among the eastern ones. Uh, naturally, yes, it, it's a, a different layer, uh, different depth, uh, depending on which people you really look at. Everybody was influenced by these peoples at the time, but it's important to be objective about the, the ratios uh, involved, right? Um, so, the mm, we will see now what the Sarmatian um, uh, land of origin, like what would be, uh, we will also see better this um, uh, Bosphoran adventure as far as even properly the relics of it are concerned, because some of them, some of these peoples were absorbed, as you understand, also by these larger ones, we, we said the Germans, but in part also the Slavs that as dominated in some cases by these peoples could be at some, some point were simply born in them and would obviously just uh, absorb them as all the sedentaries would do, especially with, with the nomads, right? And we will look uh, also at the ascetic um, Sarmatian legacy, if you, if you want. So, again, terminology is important. What does Sarmatians... Um, as a name stem from, right? We find two na two distinct names, Sarmatai and Sauromatai. As we'll see now, these two names actually correspond, according to ancient historians, to two separate peoples, right? And the um, Sauromatians, fundamentally, would indicate kind of a, a broader group from which at least the early Sarmatian culture originated from, and that surely are connected like that. The etymology is not entirely clear, right? If we just look at the Atlantic side of the story, um, the idea that the uh, creatures used like uh, as military banners, I made mean, just recently a video about the, the Draco standard in the Roman army and its origins, um, and so this this the, the, the lizard, the sauros in, in, in Greek that would also beautifully you know describe the uh, especially the reptile like scale armor so of these dragon standards um, as fascinating as it is uh, is likely not uh, connected with the origin of the people 
right? Uh, they surely speak of the the sense of the the Sarmatians in the hand, um, deity, heroic figures, also are pre present in the Ossetian mythology. There are like um, steel men, right? That are obviously essentially embodied. All these peoples were very advanced metal metallurgically speaking. Because the elites were truly ultra elites, uh, even though most of the other warriors were just, you know, horse archers, lighter troops, um, and they they would confer to the sword, to the to armor, uh, some a, a beyond value, right? Some sort of um, magic power that you can see again in, in the in the legend of the uh, sword in the stone that uh, fundamentally. It reflects the the boreal practices of the Sarmatian auxiliaries remain in Britain um, uh, in uh, you know after Roman times uh, and uh, fixing the, the sword was the alter ego of the warrior on the Kurgans and of course uh, have connecting uh, divine power to that because of the traditional view of the spark of divinity in man and the elevation and the capacity, the transfigurational capacity, even as far as the remains of these people's the tonic dimension was, was, was concerned, it could um, emanate from the same tomb, even after the spirit, at least the, um, the if he had succeeded in doing so, the spirit had to, that would have departed for heaven, um, in any case, other etymologies have been proposed, and none of them is entirely clear. One is the uh, uh, East Iranian plural suffix ta, um, uh, uh, th uh, so from the Thai, and uh, sauruma, uh, instead, uh, from the Iranian root sar, right? That would indicate a sort of... Uh, um, speed that these people would have had in migrating, right? Which indicated naturally sort of spring kind of offensive aggressive capacity. The old Indic base Tsar too is connected in this sense to uh, the term, uh, also to the derived term Tsarati, Tsaru, which means hunter, right? So the idea that the simple proceeding of the, of the knight out there in the world would conquer and hunt and prey is a sort of word as a private possession um, it, and there are for example in the Persian Sh uh, Shaname some um, uh, characters that um, have uh, named after the, the same root right so it's something that of course uh, revolves around a bit the broader Iranian speaking world right another etymology um, would uh, be instead of Indo-European, uh, a broader Indo-European uh, root uh, that is Sarmat, that would be Sarmat with a bit like the same Latin word for uh, seed, for seed for fertility. Um, so the fact that the Sarmatians would have been rich in women, either as praise of war because this was the practice, literally uh, rape. You had to essentially slaughter the man and uh, essentially breed with their women because it's as if you had, in that sense, absorbed um, all that power you could reproduce with them as, as your legitimate prey. Some others also looking at, as we'll see now, some Amazonic practices, that is to say, the fact that, as you know, there were some Sarmatian women who were buried in arms and there were legions, especially gravitating uh, around the, the, you know, in Greece, around the idea of the, of the, of the maiden who collected uh, heads before getting married. So this, this idea of true, uh, not necessarily of a matriarchy, which would be incompatible at, at least with the most brutally and traumatically violent, properly virile, patriarchal, and properly identitarily European meaning and purpose of existence. Uh, and that, in fact, has, is a bit of a puzzle for the historians of religion. And I have my own opinion about this. First of all, okay, it's a bit of a thorny, at least it's thorny to explain it superficially, but let's put it in this way. As I said before, it were, these peoples were really many. Right. In many ways, they were violent, they were nomadic, uh, 
we know that in these societies women are not necessarily actually you know matriarchy is anthropologically an extremely rare thing right especially after that there is no such thing like a matriarchy in europe after the bronze age of any sort uh, all the uh, european civilizations it was Mediterranean, are all brutally patriarchal and this is the, the the hardcore the most hardcore western identity over which the same apollonian military uh, authoritative and rational um heavenly um creed uh, revolves around but again the idea that there is always from in all these mythologies something rising from the tonic um um earthly determines uh, superstitious dimension that is properly the uh, the female right the uh, the earth as as the womb of uh, to be to being gravitated by the set by the, the the deity of thunder right so like Zeus Jupiter and all these you know indo-european leaders and so um, the idea that this lower forces are still there and in order to transfigure you have to tame and elevate yourself to the sky always made present in these cultures the if anything also the danger of a uh, sanitary bronze age kind of uh, cult of the mother earth and all this stuff and it's possible that in some areas of the, the pontic steppes first con- considering the fertility uh, of the land and all this stuff there were some kind of regurgitations of amazonic um kind of um you know cultures from which maybe the because there there is also this idea that the Greeks may have actually instilled in these people so a bit the mythology of the Amazons themselves, right? And that also the the burials, the female burials with with arms and armor, etc., would have been just a classicistic way of the Sarmatians to say, ah, let's do uh, what this you know the most single most influential culture around that is the the Hellenic one says regarding us being brutes that are so militarized that even some at least of our women mostly the uh, yeah we can presume it was also kind of a nobility thing have to do with this form of um you know of, of exercise i mean even the spartan women famously enough were selected by their men on the base of some kind of wrestling right um the greeks um uh, also called the uh, the Sarmatians, Gunai Kokratumenoi, that is to say, ruled by women. And this, again, doesn't mean that it was the case, because otherwise there is no evidence of that. I mean, these peoples are all, like, in their mythologies, in, even in the the majority, of course, of the of the graves, etc., displaying an unequivocally patriarchal system. Um, just the, the idea of, say, subversive savagery, that the Sarmatians inspired to more, um, say, refined peoples like the Greeks may have brought to this kind of exaggeration. It's like the, the Sarmatians lived in a world upside down where so also women um, r- r- ruled uh, instead of men, except it was just maybe a simple spin-off like it happened, I don't know, in other tribal realities of, you know, women being buried with weapons, but, you know, their societies having literally nothing to do with any form of geno- uh, gynecocracy, um, which is essentially, in fact, the, the disgustingly feministic thing that has been tried by um, essentially nationalists and or socialists, because at the end of the day, I think really that they're the same thing, a step towards communism, have done for the Viking era, for the Norse. Um, and any person who has studied Germanic history knows that those are some of the most severely, brutally patriarchal societies ever and nobody really understand how a bunch of alienated and undereducated people from the 21st century can come up by saying you know in the viking era because the saga still tells the history of, of a woman that very often if you know it's just like the angelic woman inspired the knights is also the the, the valkyrie the fields and so on it's a metaphor in many ways it's present that fights and eventually even maybe settles down and she starts just uh, sewing after you know, at home ne- next to the fireplace after she got married is is possible, but is is of course an exception, right? Because there is no evidence of any kind structurally uh, in any historical field of any uh, rule, right? That women actually carried out on a even nearly systemic base 
right? Which is very different from saying, okay, women existed, they some were very powerful because they were noble, etc., and they took care of certain aspects. But if you have literally the ABC of any ethno-anthropological, juridical, historical, literary knowledge about what you know Western history, you perfectly know that there is not even room for the possibility of any of this by some strange accident having missed been missed by chance right it, it's a complete mental disease that must be healed uh, quite quickly right through a proper a proper acculturation now um, th this aspect again however of the chthonic element also among the barbarians is something that I always pointed out that we often you know skip the fact that it, it was much more likely to have um, uh, let's say a, a feminine uh, kind of tonic uh, Dionysian dimension in the at the outskirts of civilization than the contrary, because those who had fundamentally succeeded had gone south, right? And th in fact, those civilizations display much more powerfully, uh, eloquently Apollonian symbols, right? More than at least the in other areas, everything was mixed. There is no doubt of that, um, but. That's why we remember the Romans for the eagle and say the Dacians or the Sarmatians for the wolf, right? There is a very specific s concept in the stage of, or, or the dragon, in the stage of civilization for which that symbol was specifically chosen and even awarded in the same Roman world, not until the, the Romans themselves reached a certain level of, of, of dominion, um, which also speaks volumes about how, uh, how uniform um, religion uh, always was right, and that the mythology that these peoples believed all different things, there was religious uh, freedom and all this bullshit is yet one of the other great mental illnesses of, you know, essentially the last couple of hundred years. Um, in any case, uh, the um, the most likely ethnonym that the Sarmatians would have had at the time would have been. Aryans, right? The we we think that, right? The the same Alani likely took the name from them, and Aryan mean simply noble, which is an incredibly spot on concept, not just traditionally, but literally for the ethnogenesis genesis of these people. Just the best ones had the right to rule, because the the sole purpose of any person should be exclusively to conquer the entire world, to save it, transfigure it, and coming back to to God, to divinity. Right, this is the only value that exists in the ancient world, and people's quality was measured exclusively on the base of how much they ruled over the entire world, and those who couldn't were considered inferior to the others in a quite rigid hierarchy by everyone, as such, including themselves. Um, so the the same spaces we're talking here, if we were to make a, a greater picture of the of Sarmatia, let's put it in this way at least in the Hellenic Roman ethnographic term, would have essentially encompassed at the time, first of all, this part of the broader Scythia, um, that would correspond roughly to today's uh, central, uh, southeastern Ukraine, southern Russia, the Russian Volga, and the south Ural regions, extending uh, west uh, in s on some occasions to parts of the Balkans and around today's Moldova, right? We will see now what, uh, also for a nomad, right, a territorial domination actually meant. For them, there was not, not such like the, the nationalist and or socialist delusion that a piece of dirt has any value, right? Uh, humanity is the cause of a fall, and therefore it's something that literally means dirty in the Latin etymology. These people's were completely turned towards the sky, towards heaven. Dirt is for the lesser people, right? Just like, again, in fact, nationalism and materialistic socialism instead stresses, and a bunch of alienated people today still thinks that this, uh, even nationalism has anything to do with any trace of universal imperial Catholic tradition, because, of course, the ecumenic, uh, rule the, was was the the entire point of this whole thing, and if you limit yourself to a piece of dirt, saying this is my country, it means that you're a lesser person because you cannot reason beyond 
conquering the world and ruling it over your own personal superiority instead of leveling yourself to an average that of course in any country is, is an abomination of the dignity of mankind in terms of just schooling, intelligence, wealth or whatever and you should just be ashamed of wherever you come from. So let's pass to a diachrony, an evenimental history of the Sarmatian people. Now, uh, the ethnogenesis uh, of the people likely occurred, at least for us to you know, be sure of the, the presence of a possible, again, cohesive feeling about being Sarmatian to some degree, around the 4th or 3rd century BC, right? Um, the Sarmatians essentially originated from the, we can say Scythian, Scythian related, again, we have to define Scythian and still have to make a video about that, let's leave it for later, but nomads or semi-nomads, um, essentially living um, in the foothills of the southern Urals, right? Uh, that fundamentally uh, laid also within a this this in between box of the South Romanians that we were observing before that dwelt between the lower Volga and the Don rivers with mm, a pretty debatable um, uh, idea of what their eastern borders could really be right because the the actual area of origin of these peoples was historically further south southeast right uh, we will see this were connected with the Andronovo culture originally these were the peoples that had dominated equestrian warfare since ever right actually in central Europe um, so again more southeast and east than this there were even more advanced equestrian cultures than the say the, than the Sarmatians themselves we have seen them here and there, the word the Saka, for example, but again, what's the actual difference between a Saka and a Sarmatian? It's very complicated, all right, um, to, to, to answer. Uh, in any case, um, what these proto-Sarmatians did was taking over the Sauromatians that um, either gave um, them partly their name, it was something as we've seen about this um, primacy that, 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 that the, the title would mean, because old names at the time were, were not, were hardly, again, um, something uh, material, uh, banal, just accidental. Most of these people's names revolved around the concept of universal domination, uh, in a way or in another. Um, so the famously enough the Sarmatians were made of different tribes the most famous of which were the Aorsi, the Roxolani, the Alani and the Yazigas. We will see a bit their history now. Um, so what, it, it's still important to stress that histor ancient historians separated the Sarmatians from the Sauromatians. Right. So even though they were surely similar, they basically lived in the same way, etc. Politically speaking, it was the the awareness of the fact that one people had fundamentally subjugated another. Probably this hungrier, more outskirt kind of frontier people managed to take over the richer, softer, gentrified ones. Still, by the brutal, uh, you know, step standard. It's, it's likely that that, that, thi that thing had been important enough also because you understand the pretty extended territories, right? So news would run, people would, would know from far away what, what was going on anyway. With major expeditions following thousands of kilometers long routes, the Middle East, the Achaemenids at some point had invaded Scythia and had been rejected because the Scythians had carried out naturally a scorched earth strategy and then confronted the Persians when these had been significantly worn down in, uh, in, the, in the Scythian interland. So lots of stuff really happening uh, in an area where the, uh, the Scythians, um, in, in fact later the Sarmatians were, were dwelling. Now during the end of the 4th century BC the Scythians uh, uh, were still essentially the dominant power in the Pontic steppe. 
However, they started suffering important reverses at the hands of the Macedonian kings, uh, Philippus II and Lysimachus, respectively in 339 and 313 BC. Um, a further Scythian setback was the failure, uh, uh, the, the failed participation in the Bosporan civil war, right, uh, the occurring in the in the last uh, in 309 BC, specifically the year of the Scythian uh, intervention. It's unimportant to digress on the background, but uh, as you understand, the Scythians wanted to at least gain. Uh, uh, properly at least a control and influence on the main ports of the Black Sea, which were mostly controlled instead by more advanced um, civilizations. And it was not an easy situation. From 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 the, the western side you have other peoples strengthening. The uh, Getai, for example, um, on the lower Danube. The uh, Bastarnai, uh, a Celto-Germanic people that um, were pushing them um, and uh, significantly eroding their power because, uh, again, the, the nomads do, do are not really the strongest, right, with, compared to the sanitaries and actually they are limited um, in their, in, probably in their cultural essence for cre in the creation of a stable political and territorial reality. Um, in... Um, uh, following also the Macedonian conquest of the Achaemenid Empire in the 4th century BC, the Seleucids, um, after the death of Alexander, um, began to um, essentially attack the Saka and the Dahai um, nomads, who were Iranian peoples as well, who lived north of, um, of the Seleucid imperial borders in, in the east um, between essentially the Caspian and the Aral Sea and this brought such uh, Iranian peoples to pressure further uh, towards the west right so compressing further and or at least you know causing a sort of domino effect of, uh, of peoples moving towards uh, the west further um, this is what from one side weakened the Scythians enough uh, and brought the Sarmatians to invade the same Scythia, crossing the Don River. What is fascinating about this dynamic is that in Western Eurasia these mechanisms would keep repeating themselves. Just make an example given that we talk about the Magyars back in the day, part of the reason why they moved in the Pannonian Basin is that the uh, military campaigns of the uh, Samanids uh, of uh, Transoxiana during the late um, 9th and 10th century had pushed the uh, August Turks, about whom I made a video by the way, at least about their heavy cavalry, um, to again push west uh, and together with that also uh, the, the Magyars among the other, the other factors, of course, nothing, say, just make deterministic in it, but still triggering this. And again, the migration uh, in North Caucasus, in fact, occurred throughout more or less all these times. You know that even the Huns, later, after the, the Sarmatians, would essentially move, uh, you know, these various uh, the boundaries with the, all this Middle Eastern more. more more central Middle Eastern powers penetrating here and there, the black hunts, the, the white hunts, uh, etc. So the first wave of westward Sarmatian migration occurred during the 2nd century BC. This involved the uh, royal, so-called royal Sarmatians, or Sayoi, right, which comes from the Sitho Sarmatian Xaya, meaning kings, right. And this was just a group of Sarmatians, uh, being the evidently the, the most um, kind of uh, enterprising, we can say, hence gaining the earliest sacrality here among among the same people. 
uh, who moved, uh, in fact, into the Pontic steppes. Also, the Yadzugas, or Yadzugas if you prefer, did. Um, this was known as also other name, but mostly Yadzugas is more, more famous. Um, initially settling specifically between the Don and the Dnieper River. Here we have the Roxolani as well. We think they were, in fact, a uh, Sitho Sarmatian tribe, perhaps also again a mixed background. Um, and uh, who followed the Yadzugas and occupied the Pontic steppes up to the Dnieper River. Uh, and raided the Crimean Peninsula during the same century, right? And uh, in the meanwhile, the, the background there was actually the, the presence of uh, Mithridates, Mithridates VI of Pontus, or at least his generals, right in the uh, Bosphor and Chersonesus, this probably the Crimea, that the, the Pontex had been... Uh, controlling by essentially crossing the Black Sea at the time. Um, and the interesting aspect of, of this is that while the Roxolani were enemies of Mithridates, the Yadzugas instead became his allies. And this shows naturally how fragmented the same Sarmatians really were. And how also attracted to these Hellenistic powers, doesn't matter how substantially ephemeral, the Pontic one really was, but um, the Bosphoran kingdom was, uh, say, sheltered enough uh, from especially the most advanced civilizations to just remain fundamentally stable and capable of repelling the same, the same nomads that would mostly seek a job there if they could. Um, the what was the fate during this Sarmatian migration of the Scythians? Well, they were fundamentally, um, if not absorbing themselves, the Sarmatians uh, being as absorbed by them. In other words, the Sarmatians began to rule over surely a larger amount of peoples that had been perhaps not entirely Scythians, but historically had been their subjects, right? So um the this steps conquerors were installing lordships over subjected peoples it was completely normal in the steps as well and somehow floating over them and thus just directing them uh, against the enemy so not differently from what the scythians had done historically done the same identical thing in the same sarmatians would undergo some degree of sedentarization uh, civilization also gentrification by a degree um, the most warlike as we'll see were the ones in fact of the, of the far east uh, whereas these other ones settled and become also for example more influenced by the Scythians more sanitary yes with, uh, with, with some important degree of territorial control but still not enough to compete with the other sedentary civilizations and still pressured by their their kins coming from the steppes. So everything was very very fluid. Um, so the Sarmatians accomplished the uh, control of the northern Pontic steppe. We find their graves uh, appearing in the second century BC. Right. Uh, we can distinguish them at least because there is a, a different way, right? We, again, the, in, in, in archaeology, we don't have tags, but we understand on the base of historiographical accounts that uh, given we know people had settled there according to that chronology, and we find archaeology exactly at that point, a wave of someone settled there, we can reasonably assume that we're talking about the same event, also because this thing wouldn't happen so you know, but by by scale, so so evidently, like on that occasion, um, some Scythians uh, had moved uh, during the Sarmatian invasions. Right, some um, gathered to uh, to Crimea, to the Dobruja region. Right, historical 
uh, region of, of the Balkans, essentially the delta of the of the Danube, the Black Sea. So, as a relic people of some sort, being absorbed by more uh, sedentary populations, either in the Bosphorian Kingdom or among the Thracians, uh, etc. Um, in any case, their power was broken for good, historically, and their identity would, would gradually disappear. Right? Remember that even when you, especially in Byzantine sources, uh, later on, that monitored these areas quite often, that there was a lot of classicism for which everybody who stayed in the northern steppes, like in classical, where, you know, where the Scythians were in classical antiquity, had to be Scythians themselves. That's the reason why they called the, the Franks the Celts, or in fact the, the Goths, the Scuti, even just in pretty early times, um, because it was just a way of, you know, uh, classicistic nominalism of some sort typical of Greek um, of Greek uh, literature at, at that point, but they're not quite, I mean, they're arguably descending from the same peoples, but their political identity has evidently changed. Um, we know that the Crimean Scythians at, at a time were the vassals of a Sarmatian queen uh, name Amage, known uh, through the writings of Polyanus, right? That was also the wife, however, of Sarmatian king Medosacus, right? Who and she ruled not because she was, as we've seen, a part of a gynocratic system, but because uh, as a regent, because her husband allegedly was just, um, you know, uh, not a particularly effective ruler. Let's put in. Uh, Put it like this: You understand how, you know, an, an idea still that a woman would rule would be strange for, for the time, and but this doesn't mean again that even among the Sarmatians it was known. And for who knows, uh, Greek literature, legions, theaters. You know, you know that especially the 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 Bosphorus becomes that the Sumerian Bosphorus. I mean, becomes um, a sort of prototype of, you know, a setting of, of the wild uh, sandwiches where strange things happen in a sort of, you know, of course, still kind of relative between history and myth. Um, th there are some important influence in Greece from coming from these peoples, some deities too that were, you know, at least were thought to be closer to, to the spiritual manifestations of the, um, in the, uh, you know, of, of other lands, right? So, Again, I'm not digressing and explaining how these gods were just part of some hypothesis of, of the bigger one, right? So, and not different national deities. Um, but the attributes that were present there we can't see being wilder, right? Because they came from the steppes people. Fiercer, right? Warlike, and etc. Not only, but I mean more, more brutally so. <laughs> Let's put it in this way. Um... So the first, in fact, who suffered to suffer, let's say, in, in the senator world of these Sarmatian settlement in the Pontic steppes, were the same Hellenic polis on her shores, right? For example, the city of Olbia, Pontic Olbia, was forced at a point to pay tribute repeatedly to the royal Sarmatians and their king, Saita Farnes. Who, in fact, is an historical figure. Of course, he is mentioned in the Protogenes inscription together with uh, the tribes of the Tisamathai, the uh, the Scythians, the Saudarathai. And again, we we are not informed clearly about all these peoples where they came from. If they were just relics of I don't know the Scythians, or were other groups of Sarmatians, of other peoples that had joined them. I mean about. Some of them we know, but again, bear in mind that there were lots of different groups that equated to the obvious political fragmentation and fluidity of the steppes confederacies. Right? We know of a Sarmatian king, Gatalus, uh, from an alliance signed between Pharnacus, king of Pontus, with Gatalus' enemies, that again highlights how. Um, by the way, at this point, uh, how, in fact, enterprising and um, 
on the move, the Sarmatians really were, because they wouldn't just stay there, right? They began to infest, famously enough, the entire Caucasus also could find them as mercenaries in, in Asia Minor, in Central Europe, right? So um, they they lived as raiders, fundamentally, and a great part of their you know capacity of consolidating power and uh, expanding further, trying to, to, to centralize to a minimum through their loot, their clientele uh, on a local basis depended on on such expeditions that, as we've seen, they historically were perhaps even giving their ethnonym like in the kind of blitzkrieg type of uh, strategic effectiveness. Uh, we know other two Sarmatian tribes, the Syracoi, the Syracus, actually, the Latin version, um, who had uh, originated in the Transcaspian Plains, right, immediately northeast of the Kyrkania, that was a, a region composed of the land southeast of the Caspian Sea, right, more or less today's Iran and Turkmenistan. But this gives you an idea of uh, also how many peoples there were who would simply join, be, become part of the Sarmatians. So that the reason why we talk about Sarmatians again is that there was an identity of some sort attached to them, either by others and partly by themselves, but they were a much larger group than the approximation of the peoples looking from just one uh, side of them couldn't embrace fully from a territorial point of view beyond. And also, again, what is territory in this context? It's just about political identity, political cohesion, and how they may have thought they had something in common and surely not being ruled in any kind of central fashion, just maybe recognizing the power, the greater power of one of them and having some kind of esprit de corps that they would exploit for, for their raids and so on, but as we'll see now, also fighting against each other more often than not. Um, and the the ARC, the other group, moving uh, to the west across the Volga and into the Caucasus Mountains foothills where an incredibly fascinating warfare existed between the essentially the Armenians, um, uh, the Georgians, uh, uh, and uh, and these steppes peoples were quite quite different things because one side you had a senator ward from the other kind of a nomadic one but you have interesting intersections there also in, essentially in a feudal reality uh, the RC migrated in this area during the second and the first century BC um, so you understand here the Sarmatians have basically broken a dam they have settled widely in the Pontic step, they are flow, overflowing further and all the, the peoples that have fundamentally um, uh, you know, moved in their wake are now finding their own settlement uh, and, uh, and fresh pastors and essentially you know, a life that would have changed them had they essentially become sanitary in the longer run, so everything would have been gradual, but naturally the riches of the civilized world attracted them uh, dramatically. So much so that uh, some Sarmatians began to take on others, right? Because um, uh, Sarmatians essentially ha had been keeping moving westwards. Um, and the Aorsi and the Syracus managed to, to, to push westwards uh, in their turn, destroying the power of the royal Sarmatians and the one of the Yadzugas, right? So the RC were able to extend their control over uh, a large territory that stretched from the Caucasus across uh, the um, Terek Kumalo land in the southwestern part of the C uh, Caspian Depression, right? In the, today's Republic of Dagestan, uh, that was importantly suited also for their um, for their for their pastors in Kalmykia. Further north, as far as the west direction was uh, concerned, and up to the Aral Sea area in the east. So 
actually an, an extraordinary uh, domination that would account as essentially one of, of a people on his own. However, the most uh, ferocious Sarmatian tribe was the one of the Alani. These were the latecomers originating essentially in Central Asia, so sp springing exactly from the, uh, the 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 forge of the you know one of the most actually the single most advanced um, uh, military cultures of the time, as far as probably knightly warfare, shock charges, heavy armor and all this stuff were concerned, again, just a, uh, a an elite, but capable of uh, gathering an enormous retinue with this incredibly impacting power that essentially nobody uh, west, at least of the Alani, was capable of replicating with that uh, force that stemmed from the cohesion of these people. Um, and uh, surely the Alani were in turn the product of some other old tribal group that we don't know of um, uh, coalescing and uh, mixing by the way with the Masagetai right, that were an ancient eastern Iranian Saka people inhabiting the steppes of Central Asia and being also part of the broader uh, Scythian culture and we will talk about these people sooner or later, hopefully. Um, and related to the Yazi, who invaded uh, Bactriana in the 2nd century BC, in this Central Asian context, interestingly enough, the Alani were related with another people known as the Yazi, who invaded Bactria in the 2nd century BC. Right? Um, the Alani were seemingly pushed west, by other people's movement, the um, the Kangyu that we will talk about uh, at a time. This was um, at least the Chinese name of a kingdom in Central Asia um, that um, had to do essentially with with Sogdian. At least this this is um, uh, surely the, the areas were in part overlapping, and still there was a also political continuity at some point, but again we will talk about this another time. Um, in in Greek and Latin, uh, these were known as the Yaxartai, uh, uh, living in the Sirdaria Basin, right? So this river in Central Asia, in originating um, essentially in the Tian Shan Mountains in Kyrgyzstan and flowing. Uh, and, and eastern Uzbekistan, by the way, flowing for more than 2,000 kilometers west and northwest uh, towards um, essentially the, the uh, through Uzbekistan, southern Kazakhstan, to the northern remnants, uh, at least of, of the Aral Sea. So we're talking about, if you follow those uh, through Google Maps, they're incredible places like in some of the ones that I honestly would like to visit the most even though I like say historical vestiges monuments and civilization but just to see those places to me uh, naturalistically speaking and thinking about all these women would be one of the single most fascinating thing uh, ever if you think how deeply connected with again these very peoples and ones that left such a powerful mark in Europe really were because in, in the steps you move fast Right, you can it can take a while just to break through the other peoples, but generally speaking, as you see, you know, see in other times, like going back and forth across the Eurasian steps is something that these people at least are able to do very quickly, um, on a regular basis, en masse. Um, now the um, the the um, the Alani pushed west by these Kangyu people uh, living in the river basin from where they expanded their rule from Fergana to the Aral Sea region. Fergana, remember, being essentially the place in which the best horses in the entire world uh, military-wise were bred, right? And the, the, the land of the heavenly horses, uh, Augustus had one, 
the Chinese emperor's head about because it was just the the best whore, war horse ever, and the Alani master um, these equestrian zootechnic uh, capacities as some of the finest knights uh, in the world, if if not probably among well the very top in fact. Um, the hegemony of the Sarmatians in the Pontic steppe um, at this point was continuing and challenged during the first century BC. Um, when uh, the Sarmatians essentially controlled the Scythians as allies, subjects against uh, Diophantus, the son of Asclepiodotus of Sinope, a general in the service of Mithridates the sixth. Um, and uh, that essentially was fighting, campaigning in the Bosphoran kingdom and around the the Black Sea in general. However, when the Romans came around, threatening, in fact, the same Pontic kingdom that it would finally destroy, and uh, you know, uh, getting interest, quite interested in, in the Cimmerian Bosphorus that was kept being ruled essentially by the Mercedes dynasty and just keeping things stable there as far especially as the um the the Pontic grain exports were 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 concerned. Uh the Sarmatians uh allied themselves with the uh with with Pontus uh to check uh the uh, uh the in fact the Roman expansion so much so that uh Mithridates uh, uh, hired some of them as mercenaries fighting with him in both Europe and Asia. Right? We'll see the Mithridatic Wars at some point. Um, this demonstrated the Sarmatians' complete involvement in the affairs, not just of the the Pontic steppes, but also of the Danubian regions of Asia Minor, of the Caucasus, where basically they were, uh, they were stretching that their power uh, into. Uh, and during the early part of the uh, first century BC, the Alani had migrated to the area to the northeast of the Lake Myothis, that is essentially the Sea of Azov, right? Um, so pushing westwards um, and more or less consolidating uh, uh, a unitary um, power, as we've seen from the top of their military quality, the Yadzugas had moved further westward. They had reached the Danube, right, and would stay there essentially until very, very late in time. Uh, the Roxolani moved instead in the area between the Dnieper and the Danube rivers. And from there they infiltrated even further west, right? Uh, and the uh, Yadzigas and the Roxolani specifically would attack the rich areas uh, around Thomas, today's Const Constanza, right? The, the, the port city in Dobrugia uh, and Moesia, right? So the uh, essentially the the, the lower Danubian uh, right bank that is also the actually the, the only fertile land uh, in ancient times along the uh, say the the only rich land, right? The only one with with a satisfactory agricultural surplus that would allow also urbanization and so on. Uh, across the entire Danube. Uh, in the process, as you understand, um, the Yadzugas and Roxolani came in contact with uh, Roman forces, uh, such as the ones that were controlling the province of Thrace, right, under Tiberius Plautius Silvanus Aelianus. Here we are uh, essentially in the moment in which the Romans have just settled, at the time of Claudius, in creating trace that had remained somehow um, peripheral uh, area where in fact pe nomadic peoples from the Pontic steppe had been pouring in like it had always uh, been the case historically. So this is one of the 
most direct, uh, let's say, uh, confrontations, the, the earliest uh, direct confrontations between the Romans and, and the Sarmatians on a, on a bigger scale. Um, the, um, uh, the, the Romans naturally managed to defend uh, the Danubian border because there was really not much that these peoples could do except raiding and you know uh, harassing the uh, the frontier. But during the first century BC, however, um, other Sarmatians had reached the Pannonian Basin. Um, the Yazigas also entered the territories of uh, today's Moldova and Wallachia. And essentially um, uh, circummarched the Carpathians by settling in the Tisha Valley, so fundamentally between the Carpathians and the Danube, um, uh, by the, the mid uh, first century BC, which was this corridor, in fact, descending from Central Europe towards the Danube, that would never be fully occupied by, by the Romans and also by other peoples later on because. It was really a very, uh, very wild area, right? Uh, in fact, better suited for steppes peoples than sedentaries. Um, in fact, also the Longobards, the Gepids, would just partly militarize it, but not really settling there. Um, and, uh, and through this corridor, the Sarmatians would periodically launch some raids uh, in Pannonia, in uh, also in Germany at, at some point, not just from there, also from further north, uh, across along the Danube and across the Danube, to uh, always being sort of this looming threat, not much of a problem, telling the truth. Um, but surely one that uh, increased a bit the instability in the area, right? Uh, they were not always, however. Uh, you know, not just particularly aggressive, nor even enemies of the Romans. For example, the Sarmatian movements uh, stopped temporarily during the first century BC, when the Dacian rule of uh, the monarch Burebista uh, uh, essentially managed to stabilize the area. The Dacians also had some predatory ambition, especially in Central Europe and in the Balkans, in order to consolidate their power, but um, in a fight using themselves, Sarmatian troops and so on, tended to be, uh, in fact, a more compact political and territorial, permanent, stable um, uh, reality, and thus, you know, uh, asking politely or not so politely to the surrounding nomads to, to cut it uh, out and the, uh, the, the the collapse however of Burabista's uh, uh, kingdom uh, uh, followed to his assassination uh, brought the Sarmatians back on the, the offensive in 16 BC uh, uh, the Roman senator and officer Lucius Tarius Rufus repelled the Sarmatian attack on Thrace and Macedon, right? Uh, while further attacks were uh, defeated by Cnaeus Cornelius Lentulus in 10 BC and 2 BC, respectively. So we are in Augustan times, fundamentally. Augustus was as you know, I made a video about that establishing properly a, a European dimension of the empire, and for this reason, um, the princeps was very interested in establishing, uh, you know, some more peaceful agreements with the uh, Sarmatians, and vice versa, because the RC possibly wouldn't know that there was some Sarmatian tribes who likely were the Orsi, sent uh, ambassadors to Augustus uh, who found an agreement with them and the uh, 
um, common interest of the Romans and these peoples was substantially securing the trade routes right from the Sarmatian steppe to uh, to the Roman Empire in fact stabilizing the area of the Bosphoran kingdom however exactly because this uh, the, the cities of um, of Crimea were, were so important for the grain export um, during the first century AD the same Syracuse and the Orsi began to uh, to struggle for control uh, in the area right they participated in the uh, Roman Bosphoran war which took place we're talking about in the second half of the 40s of the first century Rome sponsored the local king Cotus the first who was allied with the Aorsi while uh, the uh, Syracuse sponsored another ruler who was still within the, the Roman clientel system but was opposed to the current uh, monarch right so uh, Rome won um, and the Syracuse as a consequence were um, uh, destroyed practically they were uh, scattered and uh, the uh, the other people would uh, start ruling over most of their land. In the meanwhile, the Alani were uh, carving ever more uh, power for themselves. In the 50s and in the 60s of the first century AD, they popped out in the foothills of the Caucasus, meaning they had crossed it from the steppes. Uh, to harass actually the Parthians at this point uh, that as you know were containing uh, uh, Rome at least the, the control of some areas on the Levantine frontier and uh, never back down even though they, they were repeatedly uh, defeated and the say the riches existing in those areas from the Caucasus the Middle East that were uh, quite um, you know attractive for for the Alani who could target here a softer power than than the Roman one right uh, at least at this point uh, the Parthians were uh, particularly you know feudal in nature they they had their own problems in controlling uh, these these peoples from the north even in the Iranian plateau there was essentially a huge frontier in which they settled part of them to to use them also uh, against the Romans but also containing the literal control of of the especially of the northern areas of the plateau um, during the first century the the Alani also expanded across the Volga to the west um, this brought them to absorb part of the Aorsi uh, and fundamentally pushing away the rest um, the Alani um, forced equally the uh, Yazidges and the uh, Roxolani uh, westwards, which increased in turn as a domino effect the pressure on the Roman Danubian frontier. Right? And uh, we know that during the first century, the, some Sarmatian ruler from the steppe named Ferzoius, Fer that we don't. Uh, identify so 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 well together with um, another one is in in his mouth were minting coins in uh, Olbia which means technically that of course this was a decentralized area namely belonging to the Roman Empire but still acting as a as an Hellenic city um, as a track of Sitho actually Hellenic city that would temporarily recognize these more immediate closer uh, rulers as their own and trying to satisfy them in this regard so Rome naturally was not in great relations at this point with, with the Sarmatians uh, the Roxolani continued uh, their pressure uh, westward uh, and they uh, they, they got so close to the lower Danube that they even managed to uh, to cross it when it was frozen in winter in 69 AD, uh, which brought 
uh, other groups, including the same Alani, to leave, uh, to come and leave uh, pretty close on the, on the coast of the Black Sea and similarly moving west um, in today's uh, Moldova and, and Ukraine. So you see the, the Alani came a long way from uh, the very central Asia to um, essentially dominate most of the Sarmatian territory displacing the others the, the other the other Sarmatians absorbing them uh, and so on there is another Sarmatian tribe the Arai who had also close contact with the Romans they settled eventually in fact within it uh, in Trace, uh, while another Sarmatian tribe, the Corali, uh, lived in the same area together with uh, a part of the Sindhi that uh, had been a, you know, essentially a Scythian people uh, living in western Cisco-Caucasia, uh, m- had migrated at some point in, in Central Europe. Right, they're known also as Sindones, Sindianoi, etc. So, you understand again that the Romans here had established essentially a, a fluid frontier where you could count on these peoples also as far as, uh, you know, uh, Fideratic were, were considered and, you know, being employed also naturally in the Roman army to fight against uh, their their king. Um, the Yadzugas, in the meanwhile, from their Tisha corridor, were annoying uh, Roman Pannonia and participated by joining with the Lugi and the Ermenduri in the destruction of the Quadic um, uh, kingdom of Banius, uh, one of the greatest Germanic ally of the Romans. During this time, the Yadzugas were essentially dwelling also in the Transylvanian Plateau. Um, they would essentially enter it uh, seasonally, right, and or for trade reasons, etc., settling, uh, in fact, within the, the Carpathian uh, mountains and uh, contributing to the ethnic definition uh, of that area. After all, um, at this point, the Romans had conquered the place, and uh, the uh, the area, the Tisha corridor, was um, uh, you know much more controllable. So part of these Sarmatians entered further the empire rather than just you know plundering it. Um, in the second century A.D., the Alani had conquered instead the steppes of North Caucasus. Uh, that were a very, uh, you know, strategic position just to move in different directions, either, you know, the Pontic Steppe or um, north of the Caspian Sea or south in the Middle East, right, so there were uh, different uh, options uh, and the, the same places in which later the Mongols would set their their bases to invade Europe, right, just to, to make you understand the steps uh, convenience there um, and um, they had also consolidated significantly their positions in, in the in north of the Black Sea creating holding together essentially a confederation of tribes under the rule they were the most important uh, Sarmatian tribe fundamentally ruling on most of the others um, and uh, they cared, as a consequence, also to maintain, after all, uh, you know, uh, a stability in the area for anyone involved. Uh, naturally, the Sarmatians lived much of the trade that um, crossed the steppes from, say, China to, to Rome and vice versa. So, connecting the Pontic steppe, the southern Urals, uh, uh, that essentially defined like also the just the latitudinally the the, the steps uh, in the south uh, the areas of today's western Turkestan right uh, these were all crucial for just to, to maintain free open to the caravans to the traders merchants and so on uh, and 
uh, also essentially saying to all the other peoples who lived around that they could control that section of the steppe so that they had the power to do it even if their um, their their territory was much more extended there was a great proof of force um, a group of the Alani the Antai um, migrated and settled somewhere uh, among the Protoslavs uh, in roughly the area of today's Poland because the, the Slavic Antas that appear in the uh, early Middle Ages are likely connected with them, displaying in fact also archaeologically some evident Iranian influence together with others, also Gothic, so every other people that had have left a mark in those territories. But just for saying how big the Sarmatian system was and in, in how, how far also west and in central Europe specifically it would settle, leave its mark. In any case that was considered a bit of a wilder kind of fringe area, like not just the best one that as we've seen was still based also in a pretty sound nomadic fashion uh, in the steppe still. Uh, now, how did the Sarmatians decline? I, I talked about that, especially in the video about the Alani, that deals with, in fact, the decline at this point of the most important Sarmatian element, keeping basically the, the ethnic cohesion of the people, if, as, we've seen, as we have defined it um, together at that point. The decline that occurred naturally out of the... Uh, just again, the, 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 the part the sedentarization, in part the uh, again, if you don't keep uh, up with that kind of deterrent capacity that derives from this brutal shock force of the stamp that can go back and forth, taming all these various peoples, essentially just certain local seigneuries will form. Mm, uh, there would be an interesting division to make also as far as the. Indo um, uh, Iranian and later Turkic peoples really uh, were because um, this knightly dimension also in the Iranian world, the type of armor, the type of supports are much more uh, sanitary looking than the later Turco Mongol uh, ones, right? Uh, there is a change within this population, so we'll talk about the single military practice and so on. Um, the units, the tactics, uh, what we can grasp for, from these people's warfare. Um, but uh, in, in, simply it's a moral reason, right? If you uh, soften up, if you become richer, more sanitarized, just uh, fall short of those standards that had allowed you to establish a power over this area in the first place, because it's not a particularly rich area. Yes, you can control the, the some quite extensive agricultural regions in north of the Black Sea. You can make money, as we've seen with the uh, with the trade routes. But again, trying to compact a political territorial domain that can last over time in this area in that time in history is very very hard to lose. So during the second and third century. Um, this decline was apparent. The same fact that the gods had migrated from the Baltic Sea as, after all, a, a more primitive people than the Sarmatians, at least in the sense of particular, you know, political social development compared to them. Um, the fact that they could simply go and settle the Pontic steppe around the third century and mixing, of course, with the Sarmatians, there wasn't really a, as you understand here, a, a state to crash, right? The gods were still sedentaries, and they mostly settled in the Bosphoran area, so where, uh, before the Greeks, the Romans had settled, so not quite in the steppe. But there was a lot of blending, right? And uh, the control from this fresh force over the ports uh, of the area, etc., meant still the, the fact that the Sarmatians had fundamentally lost right the the supremacy in general there were some internal problems um, 
and one of the major uh, ones would uh, profile themselves were mostly of course from the steppes and the approach of the Huns that gradually also a bit of a mysterious people as far as the origins are concerned uh, we, there are famously enough uh, hypotheses on their you know their uh, identity origin uh, ethnic background they were quite seducing but generally speaking they um, they had also a very complex uh, expansion towards the west, a gradual one. Surely they were mixed with the Sarmatians. There is surely an important Sarmatian sustratum in the Hunnic Empire, because just the Huns had come to rule over them. Um, uh, but um, when you see uh, the, uh, the general... Uh, outline you realize that also many Sarmatians were properly broken by the Hunnic uh, invasion you can see that the same uh, Gothic kingdom of the Bosphorus was fundamentally shattered and the uh, the gods basically reemerge um, uh, as far as the eastern chunk at that point was concerned only after the collapse of the Huns as a as an independent policy and quite changed from the experience by the way so the Sarmatians at that point after this tidal wave had really been uh, over right the the area was surely quite it's just like imagine at sea when you see this massive wave and then there is all that kind of re uh, kind of mixing of you know of sand of, of, of water and everything and everything looks quieter because it's been spent but you know that that the water is still there well um uh, the the word that word had been changed the the same germans as you know had put themselves in motion because of of many reasons but also these agitations the fact that they didn't want absolutely to end up under the ants uh and uh they uh generally speaking had had kind of polemical relations are put in this way with with the same the Iranians back in the day so um, the migration here was not really a happy moment for anyone involved uh, and the uh, Sarmatians had a sort of diaspora we've seen it well with the Alani that were the most important uh, or at least more political at that point like the the most the strongest political entity the one that would keep high say the Sarmatian banner if at least even assuming they they reasoned like that as we were saying identically at the beginning uh, and we know in fact that many of them f- spread so far and wide because the Huns weren't tender with them we know that a significant number of Alani was massacred by by the Huns specifically in part they had been absorbed into the Hunnic uh, domination this mostly occurred east of the Don River right Uh, the the Alani living west of the Don uh, for a while remained uh, free and in a sense they could also move Um, but uh, what was coming from the east was evident that all that had been their ancestral land had been overrun fundamentally uh, and this was a proof of their political failure at the end of the day so uh, the the Alani remained uh, uh, in part in those same areas in part as we've seen there is a connection with the accessions the re that is essentially the last true properly independent uh, Alan power because the others mostly in the west were taken over by the Germans think about the Vandals uh, the, 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 the Alani were all uh, split into smaller groups let's say that wouldn't make it alone out there to create a uh, a major power in the West. They carved some synchrony here and there. Uh, also in uh, in Lusitania, they had an important impact. But generally speaking, they were fringe areas, right? And they had lost it just as a domination. Um, 
we know also that the Alani contributed together with other elements, mostly of Germanic origin, in the demise of the Huns, right? Uh, there were properly battles that they fought uh, to uh, Nedao specifically. Uh, to 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 break themselves free of the Hunnic yoke. So, some of these peoples remained under the Huns also because of convenience after that. But generally speaking, after Attila's empire crumbled, and the, the last descendants fundamentally were taken out, um, there was not like a free Sarmatian power, an intact Sarmatian power uh, standing in the place where the, it had existed up to the third century, right? It had, it had already been significantly reduced by by the gods and so on. Um, some Alani came, took refuge in the mountains of the Caucasus. As we've seen, this was the origin of the Ossetians, the Kabardians, likely, right? At least it contributed to their ethnogenesis. There were some other Alan groups surviving in Crimea, right? Others established their seigneuries in Central and Western Europe. Uh, we know in Britain, in Spain, we already said it, uh, in Vandal, Africa, etc. Um, as far as the Bosphoran Kingdom was concerned, well, this had been mostly Hellenic. Uh, or sit Atlantic historically, and then the Romans had come, and then the, the gods had come. And so, uh, again, whoever lived in the steppe could hegemonize it at some point um, or influence it strongly, but not really, ru say, ruling directly from it and making it, oh, we are the Sarmatian power here. No. Um, the Bosphoran kingdom was essentially part of the the Roman Empire, who would remain essentially a Byzantine colony. Um, other islands assimilated with other populations, the Maotians people, uh, that uh, also probably have to do with um, the Proto-Circassians, which were another Caucasian people, especially from the Caucasus, the descendants of the Alani and other Sarmatian groups uh, kept sending, as we were saying at the beginning, f very fine, probably the top um, elite bodyguards to the great empires around. You find them really often throughout all the Middle Ages, um, uh, even pretty late uh, in time, uh, in the early modern age. And um, the, of course, the descendants, just ethnically speaking, of the Sarmatians are pretty much present in, you know, in the areas that they had controlled um, in a broader Iranian perspective, but that, of course, absorbed by peoples that today speak, say, I don't know, uh, you know, Slavic, for example, language or Turkic languages and so on. So... Um, this is perhaps for for another video. Um, what we can say, however, about their further origins is, as we've seen, that uh, the the Sarmatians fall fundamentally among the Iranian steppes peoples um, as a broader, say, as a as, as a group of the broader Scythian family, akin to the Saka and so on. These are called East Iranians. Uh, and they are essentially descending uh, from the earlier Timber Grave and Andronovo cultures. Right? So they are the ones from which properly uh, the domestication of horses stemmed, from which uh, uh, mounted warfare began with chariots, with, with cavalry. Um, so we're talking about the the very cradle of equestrian culture. Um, we can identify uh, the first Sarmatians clearly with the Prokhorovka culture that essentially moved from the southern Urals, as we've seen, to the lower Volga during the 4th to 3rd century BC, archaeologically.
we have seen what were the, the subdivisions of the Sarmatians. Um, and as far as the language is concerned, again, it's an Iranian language, the old Iranian. Um, and the Sarmatians were so such a big confederacy that, of course, uh, their tongue could significantly differ to the point that it's probably not also very wise to try to, to group them too strictly uh, together. Um, today's, uh, w w what we think, at least um, Iranian people in today's southern Russia especially, um, sp can speak in terms of something similar to the old Sarmatian is very uh, complicated to, to assess what we know. Of course there are many dialects nowadays that stem from a dramatic blend of influences that again it's not completely wise to just connect to the to the Sarmatians but just observe that they are Iranian languages and so that that is this is a big deal as far as the prevalence of other languages around as we've seen um, even over the descendants of the Sarmatians uh, are concerned. Uh, Alanian Ossetian is what we think uh, to be the closest language uh, of the Sarmatians or that of the Alans specifically um, but we cannot simply say that for example Old Ossetian was just the Alan language was spoken just in ancient times by the Alani or specifically or not even properly and with, without significant changes in other Sarmatian people. Um, as far as their uh, say outlook um, from one side these were a warlike people so we know about them through their warfare through their arms and armor uh, most of the uh, of the Sarmatians would have been equipped with you know corselets made of some organic material raw or hide some shields even weaker ones and uh, spears bows swords were, were out there um, the Sarmatians at their best were famous for their uh, remember before their heavy cavalry tactics that consisted in an armored elite that originally was also capable of f performing both roles of shock and archery but that specialized um, towards like again an armored elite for, for the shock and the majority of horsemen as archers the western you went in the Pontic step the more kind of javelins um, and Probably some of also the poorer Sarmatians were, so it was not so easy to find heavier troops than from the spring of Central Asia, on average, right? And they looked more like, um, say, the the, the cavalry of, say, uh, the Germans or the Thracians, right? Uh, in a different political and social context. Uh, anyway, that's still steps, so rather than thinking that it was the Westerners in kind of influencing them, consider that the um, the Sarmatians are right up to the Vistula, according to Pliny. So the um, if you look at European geography and you see where the steppes end, and even still today, where properly the boundary between certain specific cultures and minorities and, um, and just the landscape, right, is concerned, you realize that there was probably something much closer to that sense of the open step in the ancient world starting from central Europe like we can appreciate in the Middle Ages as well and that probably things were not so different in, in absolute terms um, the, um, the the warfare uh, changed uh, accordingly scale armor again was very very much praised, especially for the Alani, they are represented also on the Roman monuments, famously enough. Other peoples had scale armor, the Dacians, the same Romans, everyone, everybody, just um, the idea that this fish scale armor worn by this heavily, you know, heavy horsemen charging 
thickly packed formation with the Contas um, uh, and bows even in battle, right? The Contas is, is a is a spear that you hold with both hands and also considered as being strapped at the horse because uh, stirrups are not yet around, uh, especially in the Pontic steps. So the the thing was, you know, an incredible feat of. Uh, physical fitness of stunt capacities and, and so on so these men were were tough right and the idea that they dominated again as nobles over other peoples uh, tells you much better what their their deal was it was not a horizontal divide on a territorial base it was a vertical divide on a moral superiority base uh, that has basically nothing to do with today's identity that is based instead on the complete denial of difference in human beings that is instead is the most obvious evidence uh, in quality and worth uh, at every level. And um, they knew better because they had to live exactly with that kind of promise in order to, to stay alive, really. And the, the, the steps are perhaps the best place in the world to understand how how that works because there are few resources um, but there are lots of people that know how to survive in spite of all and have pretty shrewd means to, to achieve that. So what did the uh, Sarmatians look like? Right. Um, so there are some people who would, would sell their own mothers into thinking that these were just cent for cent blonde blue eyed people. Uh, surely they were uh, mixed by some degree, and surely they. Um, I already know that this video will be clicked on a lot, right? Because I know how uh, the the mechanism works. There are lots of kids that are obsessed exclusively with, um, uh, you know, wh what kind of appearance you have, and so. Uh, the Alani become especially the, the bit of the symbol of the ultra Aryan Indo-Europeanness and everything. Let's put it in this way: um, as we've seen, there, there were surely mixed. There were surely some elements from far away. There were surely some, uh, let's say, uh, you know, quite composite backgrounds to this all. It is true, though, that the majority of these peoples. Um, were considered, at least stereotypically, to look pretty fair, right? Ovid, for example, says that one of the Sarmatian tribes, the Coralli, we mentioned them before, had blonde hair. And Ammianus, in the uh, late uh, empire, also uh, des uh, describes the the Alans as such, right? He wrote that the, the Alani were, quote, of great stature and beauty, their hair is somehow yellow, their eyes are frighteningly fierce. Um, these populations were stemmed, again, from the cradle, properly of Indo-Europeans. We know that uh, the, the problem Indo-Europeans had a very high incidence of, especially um, blue eyes, because blue eyes are more frequent even than properly blonde hair. Um, and that these were essentially the, the people in the world that had the greatest concentration, right? Um, so I've read somewhere it's possible 70% blue eyes, something like that. I don't know how much that of that is true, but vectorially it is true that these were the whitest people around, practically. There may be some debate regarding to that, maybe thinking at which times, like because the Yamnaya's you know, the, you know, expanded at some point also in Northern Europe where there were less people moving in and today at least Northern Europeans are the widest uh, people ever. So we can th maybe think that by the time, say, the, the islands came to rule over the Pontic steppe, maybe these populations had already mixed substantially with other subjects that were not so fair as them. But there were still probably, you know, we're talking about whites, right? We're talking about ca Caucasian peoples. Um, and there has been, since the Alans, become a bit this, the prototype of these ultra kind of almost Ubermensch kind of 
of warriors and so on, the guards of Roman emperors, the fact that they were reactivating that sense of grandeur, of glory, of celestial invincibility, and that they were objectively very tough, and they were surely also physically selected. Um, a, a debate uh, has arose, that this is what I meant, about how much this is true, right? The the late Roman ethnography points out that these guys were famous for being blonde, right? But it's it's just like you say, I don't know, today in our culture we say that Germans are blonde, but, you know, just a minority of them actually is. So we don't really know about that, um, uh, even about properly the ethnic ones, how, how they looked. We, we will never actually know, right? Surely they were pretty white, uh, surely many of them were blonde, many of them even more had blue eyes or whatever. Whichever debate stretches further in this sense is, I don't think, very interesting. right? I think it, what, what is more interesting is uh, how these people came to be politically and how, how they remained even later. Because, of course, again, we descend, surely. Like if you are a European, it's it's a bit difficult not to have a drop of sarmatian blood in your veins not just if you come from ukraine or you know uh, other areas the, 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 there is a lot of iranian blood uh, of course among peoples that are much darker than europeans uh, think about the same iran right or uh, you know many other areas so of course if you look at even the obsessions or peoples that are supposed to be descending straight from the islands they, they don't inspire you know a particular you know fairness compared to to a fin or to, to to a sweet but that's obvious if you in fact study the history of those countries but there is no doubt that all over the formerly uh, say for, for the, the eurasian steps there are people there are sometimes turk there are sometimes like again part of ethnic groups that are Say phenotypically not uh, thought to be particularly uh, white, but that are probably some of the whitest people that you you don't see even in Scandinavia. So white. Um, this has to do with a lot of things. Think about in India the Ved uh, and all this stuff. So th this is a complex issue. Uh, what is interesting for me is to think one. Uh, about this thing that they uh, ritually did, uh, like in Rome, like wherever, that, you know, simply going to pick the... Uh, and this is what the Indo-European conquerors did everywhere, the women of the subjected peoples, and properly breeding with them for very specifically eugenic purposes at the time. I mean, just look, think about the Tarpian rock, think about the fact that Again, warriors in archaic times had to be selected physically. In a sense, the weather and some, the environment in general would do it. Um, uh, this is surely the reason why, I don't know, Northern Europeans are taller on average. It just emerged, or some peoples from probably from, from, from Central um, Africa, because, because simply the environment is, is, is a nightmare. So for all... The tall people you see there, you see essentially all those, the, say the smaller ones, who, who died in a way in that brutal environment. Um, here, the steps surely had been one of the places in which this selection had been engineered the most, because literally these peoples were so pressured by the, the shortage of resources that they literally invented horses, they invented properly the idea of feudalism, uh, all this kind of uh, religious beliefs that fundamentally we, be we believe still as tradition and that actually make a lot of sense. They have a lot of scientificity to it. Basically, all our language, uh, European-wise, is, is deriving from the celestial sounds that, uh, that uh, these primitive languages were imitating. Um, and very, very, in very straight ways, I will make videos about that, so these things are fascinating. They surely bred with lots of other peoples. As I was saying at the beginning, however, there is a very markedly strong Indo-European 
face that we see from the genetic finds, right? Uh, there was a guy uh, that uh, I made a video, I think last year, or whatever it was, about the Hanek identity. That wasn't about genetic studies or whatever, but it was that's that, but um, it was uh, basically playing around with this historiographical ideas of where the Hans, what are the sources that talk about this, etc. We well, got pretty upset because I said that, you know, yes, peoples like the Scythians and Sarmatians do turn out to be strongly Indo European genetically speaking. Um, and, um, and he said, oh, they were Turks because their rituals were the same. In the steps, all rituals are the same. That's not a genetic indicator, right? It's even wrong to say properly Indo European in the sense of just a language, but there is an overlapping by some degree. Um, but yes, the steppes, the, Indo uh, the, the, the Eurasian steppes were dominated by Indo Europeans very, very far east, right? Much more than we usually thought. So surely among some Sarmatian there was a proto Turk among them. Uh, the, the, some pro, some of them, right, from many other groups. If you look at the, say, I don't know, even at the Saka in some in some context, so you realize some of them were pretty mixed. By the way, uh, they they adopted also different customs. For example, some of them deformed their skulls, as you know. So th this thing becomes complicated to distinguish in terms of you know, it's just a physiognomic phase, or is 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 it? how they render it artistically in the iconographic source, or is it something else? Um, they had a different idea, different standards of appearance and how to identify themselves uh, and so on. Surely if you see some Tocharian paintings still in the early medieval times, you see dramatically white people. I, 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 I placed it in as a picture in the, in the video about the Kushan and the uh, and the Tocharians. So the point is, sh shall we make just of these people as an epitome of blondness or whatever? Uh, uh, they looked surely, you know, some of, some were blond, some weren't. Um, likely the majority wasn't, right? They may have been fair, white, no doubt, but, you know, uh, literally there have been s s scholars like Previte Orton, Neumann, Bachrach, etc., that literally had to write about all this. And w all what we have is just like a, a pretty scattered genetic uh, evidence and just a bunch of sources from the Romans saying that these guys were blonde, right? That's it, right? Do we have to make a, a great case about this? Surely, of course, if you are, can bring a lot of info about that, it's interesting. But, uh, you know, let's try rather to teach what these people actually did. Because, first of all, that's what they were mostly identifying themselves with. Being literally superior. Also because of their appearance. They believed, absolutely, that the body reflected moral virtues. And so they, they were pretty proud of themselves. There was all an aesthetics about that. But at the same time, we don't even see sources making this central to anything. So uh, I realized that there are lots of people that are racially obsessed for all the cultural reasons of our world, especially in the last couple of hundred years. But um, at the end of the day, um, you know, that, that's where they, that's all what they are, right? Uh, they're not much of a, of a dramatic historical interest. Uh, we have famously some depictions of the Sarmatians too from some sarcophagi and so on. And yes, they look pretty, pretty Caucasian. Uh, there is no, no doubt about that. Um, and this is something about the Sarmatians. We can talk at some other time about Scythians and archaeogenetics, Western steppe herders, and all these kind of things. But I prefer another video. Uh, surely have to talk about Yamnaya culture, step pastoralism, uh, this ancestry, if, if you're interested, right? Um, I know that you're generally speaking interested, but we must go down to pretty 
pretty complex things. And then we will talk about other peoples, the Sumerians, the Andronovo culture, and also how these Iranians, uh, you know, have to do with the early Slavs, which is a very fascinating topic. In other cultural influences scattered here and there. As you know, I covered these topics mostly in the Migration Era playlist, Germanic History playlist. I plan to create an Iranian History playlist, so you can find it there probably by this, the point you listen to this video. Uh, and I, I would stop it here, we will keep talking again. I think we have to describe uh, really Sarmatian warfare in dedicated videos, multiple ones. I plan really to make many about the Sarmatians because they are objectively important, fascinating. There is a lot there in terms of technicalities of warfare as well, doctrine. Uh, uh, it's very instructive, really, aside from the strictly ethnic or, you know, just f folk side of the story. Um, and steps warfare in general, because as you know, I do have a pl pretty large playlist about that as well. For today, however, really, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.